two Poundland uh, cob-based LED work lights. The first one, which is styled in a mechanics work light, has a simple on-off switch, just one intensity, that's it. Quite nice, actually. I quite like the switch. It's a very traditional style. It's got a powerful magnet in the base. Let me just demonstrate that magnet. It is very powerful. So it really does hold it in position when you're working. And I have used this. Uh, the day I bought it, I ended up working my brother's bike. And uh, it was uh, it was really useful having this because I was able to just stick it to the uh, part of the bike and just point the light into where I needed to modify the wiring. Uh, Notable that it comes with, uh, it costs £2 incidentally, it comes with uh, three included Warriors uh, zinc chloride type cells. And when I tested this on 4.5 volts, which would be the fresh cells, uh, if it was fairly good quality ones, it drew 1.5 amps. Uh, that's equivalent about 6.75 watts. I get the feeling there's no resistor in this. At 3.6 volts, the nickel metal hydrides, it would draw 700 milliamps and dissipate at 2.5 watts. So I think, to be honest, this is better suited to nickel metal hydride cells. The other one uh, is a multifunction unit. It's got a little swing down stand. It did not come with batteries. I have since fitted it with uh, Poundland's finest uh, Kodaki style zinc chloride cells. The ones I normally recommend against. And. Uh, this one has a button that selects between a flashing red LED, where it's got six LEDs in the middle of the cob, six red chips, or click off, click on again, and it's got ten uh, white chips, and it puts out a fair pack of li light. However, on 4.5 volts on the bench supply, this one tested at 600 milliamps, so that uh, equates to just over two watts, and that's that's all right. That's okay. That's uh, reasonable enough for that size of cob, I think. But at 3.6 volts, it dropped to 300 milliamps, which is about a watt, which is ample. You know, that's still quite bright. But anyway, so we get 10 chips in this one, in this little linear cob, and we get 10 chips on the outside and then six red in the middle. Let's open them up. We shall start with this one. So there's a screw hole at the bottom. These are, if anything, if you consider the cost of getting uh, cob LEDs, they're not that expensive off eBay, but for £2 to have something local, a 3 volt cob chip could be quite useful. These could be adapted. You could uh, convert this one very easily with a resistor and a USB power supply into a uh, rechargeable USB work light. Not a, well, not, you could make it rechargeable with nickel metal hydrides. The, I don't see a resistor, uh, but it would make a useful, uh, with that resistor it could, you know, just the cable going up inside here, it could make a useful little USB stylish work light. So the cob, I can give you the dimensions. Shall we just pop that out? Yes, let's pop it out. Now, this is why I got it, isn't it? Let's, uh, it's heat staked in onto the plastic. That uh, metalised looking reflector is just a sort of metal spray. So the cob has two connections going on one end. It's got a couple of small holes for mounting, possibly. Well, that was what it was, the heat stakes. And then it's got the same connections going out the other end. That is fairly common. Let me bring in a recent purchase. I do have other uh, calipers, but these ones are on all the time type calipers. It's actually quite useful. These are also horribly light because they're carbon fibre, but um, they actually seem pretty good. The, they seem accurate compared to the other ones. Let's uh, measure this. It's about 60 millimetres long by about 8 millimetres wide. So 60 millimetres long by 8 millimetres wide. Very hackable. I am so tempted to turn this into a little USB light because that would be quite interesting. Okay, let's take a look at the other one. She'll put the calibre out the way with its round cob. Oh. Right, tell you what, let's get a thinner screwdriver, shall we? Evidence that I don't open these in advance before uh, making the videos. Because I got the wrong driver. Smaller screws. You could use the other screwdriver bits you get with the Poundland uh, screwdriver set. But I didn't. Now the question is, are the four screws going to release the front completely? Or am I going to have to take other screws out? Are there hidden ones? Is there one in the battery compartment? I can feel the front coming off. It's off. Oh, right, okay. Oh, we do have resistors. Oh, is, is that one little transistor type component? What is that? That's doing the flashing. 
That is doing the flashing. Is it marked? It's marked. Hold on, I shall clear the, the steaminess off this. I'm very excited. Uh, the resistor is marked 1 ohm. That component is marked 2824A. 2824A. Uh, can you see that? Maybe not. Uh, and that's all on board. So this switch here is switching from the battery. It's one of those uh, rotating inside switches that uh, clicks around the contacts. And it is alternately switching between two inputs in that. One input is going straight via the resistor. The other one is going via this uh, little component, which will have enough impedance to actually limit the current. Oh, that's interesting in its own right, isn't it? That that little cob. So what happens if we power both up at once? Well, I think we need to do that. We can do that. We can make a flashing pastel red light by just shorting those out. Short. Oh, if I can get a good connection, not getting a very good connection. Perhaps the wrong tool to actually short this out. It's not shorting out very well, is it? I'll short it out on the board. This is not a very conductive. Uh, that just completely obliterates. I think the red is still flashing in there, but you can't actually see it. But there we go. That's interesting. So now... Now, I've got the arch now to modify this. One moment, please. The modification has been done. The USB lead has been added. It now has multifunctional uh, applications. It is effectively an emergency light now. In the back of this are three nickel metal hydride cells. You could use anything. These are just generic sort of Poundlandy Kodak ones. But you could use uh, any loops. Now, the thing about nickel metal hydride cells is you can trickle charge them continually. They will, you know, they will. What happens is when they're fully charged, they do vent uh, gas from the electrodes. But because of the chemistry inside, it recombines. So all they do is they get very slightly warm when they're fully charged, depending on the current. In this case, the current is currently sitting at 44 milliamps from the USB to charge the batteries. When you turn the light on, the current jumps up to about 185 milliamps because it's not only charging the batteries, but it's now powering the light. It's, it's not super mega bright. That could be tweaked, but it is what it is. These, uh, in a room, this would make a great emergency light because it is just a low-level light. It's a sort of ambient working light. It's useful, but not. it's not going to like light your whole house. If you want more light out of this, just cut these plastic things out of the way because uh, it, that decorative protector does actually block quite a lot of the light. Uh, when you unplug it completely, it will go slightly dimmer, but it will stay lit and it will still provide illumination. And that's the emergency function, because if you leave it turned on, then when power fails, that will come on itself just by the design of the circuitry. Let me show you the circuitry. It's very straightforward. I shall focus down onto there. The USB comes in, and it, this is the stack of nickel metal hydride cells. It's worth mentioning you cannot put in alkaline cells. If you do put alkaline cells in, unlike the nickel metal hydride, they will, when it's fully, it's taken some charge, you'll get gas forming on the electrodes. And when that happens, you will end up with pressure building up inside. And if that pressure keeps building up because it can't recombine it chemically into electrolyte again, the alkaline cells will explode forcibly. You should know that. This is why I don't really approve of the, uh, the alkaline rechargers because uh, they're not that great. So there is a Schottky diode here and it charges, if we just look at this section first, it charges the nickel metal hydride cells simply because there's a diode in series just to stop it discharging. Because you know how some chargers, uh, if you plug it into it and there is no diode stop back feed, it will make the LED in the charger glow and it will basically drain the battery slowly over time. So uh, that's what that diode's there. I chose a short key diode, a 1N5817 or whatever you can get, purely because it's got a low forward voltage draw, about 0.3 volts in this case. The silicon diode was just a wee bit too high. Although, having said that, I think it would still work. So the USB comes in, it trickle charges these via two 22 ohm resistors in parallel to give 11 ohms. And that equates when it's fully charged 
to about 40 milliamps trickle charging. You could adjust that. The reason I used two in parallel was just to tune the value. Two 22 ohm resistors in parallel gives 11 ohms, and uh, that also increases the power dissipation of those resistors because each one is rated quarter of a watt, so you end up with roughly half a watt. And it's just because if you were charging this uh, battery from being completely flat, it would initially, because of the diff voltage difference, it would actually draw quite a bit more current. The current does actually progressively drop as it charges up. The switch, when you turn it on, will also divert the USB current through these resistors, which are also two 22 ohm resistors. All these values can be juggled. And then through the uh, cob array of 10 LEDs. Um, but when the switch is off, it's still charging the batteries. When the switch is on, it's lighting these LEDs, but it's also charging the batteries. And then when you disconnect it, or if you've just got it out and about, when you close that switch, it's going to connect the batteries with two sets of resistors in series, and that just reduces the intensity, which is, uh, it's still useful, but it's not mega bright. But it's just a, a, a balance. It's the simplicity of the circuitry. There's not much to it. I implemented this circuitry inside the light like this. I shall zoom out just a little bit. Here's the USB lead come in. It has a cable tie as strain relief. It just basically ducks in the back here. Oh, that's handy. The, the magnet in the back is also a good park for the connector. So the cable ducks in the back here. There's a cable tie on the other side. The It goes to the negative via the, the short key diode there. Uh, and the negative then goes straight to the LEDs as well. That's the battery pack negative. It then goes to the one switch contact and that switch contact is either going to bridge it to uh, the LEDs or just have it trickle charging the uh, batteries all the time because it is those resistors are just permanently in line with the USB connector to the battery pack. And it's only when the switch is closed here that the current will also flow uh, to the LEDs or in the case of the power going off from the USB, it will flow from the batteries through those resistors, across the switch, through those resistors and to the uh, LED array. And that's it. Really not that complicated, but still very useful. I feel I feel the need to show you how useful it is by taking exposure off, um, turning this off, and this will exaggerate things a bit, but I'll, I'll give, that is amply useful about my light, but you know, those lines are just actually annoying that this projects, but it's still a very bright light. And when it's plugged in, let me just plug it in the intensity bumps up further and uh, it's amply useful for just ambient light at a sort of workbench or something like that. Not for mega working, but you could easily read by this, but just sort of ambient levels of light. But this is fully tweakable. It's fully adjustable. Note the capped on tape that I used to stick that uh, LED, the cob, back in again. You don't need to remove the cob if you modify one of these yourself. But uh, there we go. That is it. The little emergency work light, let me unplug it and you'll see the sudden, actually I'll lock the exposure off, and you'll see the sudden drop in brightness, but it still stays lit. And uh, it will stay lit for quite some time, because as the voltage in the cells drops, it will balance out and you'll end up with a, a reduction in current, a slight reduction in intensity, and it will go on for potentially a very long time. But there we go. Interesting project, a good hack for that uh, Poundland light, and I do really like that cob. That, uh, I'll just light it completely with this now. Hold on, I'll just plug in my little work light here. He said, shoving the USB lead in upside down as usual. And I really like this. I could not find that little chip though. The little uh, flasher chip. The nearest I could find is a one in a T092 package, which has a one or two hertz option for flashing. But interesting that it's all built onto one little cob. That that must be aimed strictly at lights like this. So very interesting, good stuff, and well worth scavenging bits out of these lights, or indeed hacking them. <laughs>